Monweni. Good evening. Goeienaand. Thank you for the video, Ponso. Before we start, I would like to ask Ms. Zanele Tio to do the safety briefing. Good evening, everyone. Can we all please take a moment and familiarize ourselves with the emergency health and safety protocol of the venue? Nelson Mandela University welcomes you to this gathering and take your safety very seriously. In line with our university values and ethos, we wish to share the following safety protocol to adhere to. We all know that incidents and emergency do occur sometimes. We need to be prepared for possibilities. To do so, please familiarize yourself with the emergency exit points. In case of an emergency, an alarm will sound, but please remain calm as this might be loud. Look at the green running persons, signs that are above entrances and exits in the venues. Calmly walk to the emergency exit points. Please help those who need assistance. If there is any elevator on the floor, please also please look for those who need assistance. Proceed to the assembly point outside. Inform your superior of any missing persons. Follow instructions given by the emergency controller. Do not leave the assembly point until all care has been issued. Nelson Mandela University thanks you for your understanding and compliance with the emergency health and safety protocols. Sia Bulela, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zanere. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening in person and online. We really appreciate your presence. I am Mukim Weng, I'm the DVC Learning and Teaching I'm from Nelson Mandela University. I'm from Graf Reinet, born and bred. Lo umipam gwenu ngumam kadi, ungui na ujola mbondo mseng chono mangal We are here today to celebrate 100 years of Utada Robert Mangaliso, Sobukwe, Umfene, Uthati, Ulisa, Ujambase. Interesting, uh, today there are hearings this evening in Hrafreinet about renaming the town to Robert Sobukwe. How befitting it would be that a man of his stature would have this kind of recognition. Without further ado, I'd like to call upon our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sibongile Mutwa, to officially welcome you. Hey, Moloeni, good evening. Goedemiddag, Dumelang. Um, I would like to greet this evening our program director, Dr. Mukimueng, uh, who is also the DVC for Learning and Teaching, and to thank Muki, as well as the Faculty of Education uh, and all the other organizers of the, uh, inter um, the public lectures uh, at our institutional public lectures at our university. Uh, for I thank you for the opportunity to deliver these remarks at this most auspicious occasion, the 2024 Mangaliso Sobugwe Institutional Public Lecture here.
here at Mandela University. We recognize uh, members of the Sobugwe family, Sebetutiweke Gumuk, here present, as well as the delegation of his political home, the Pan Africanist Congress, who are also gracing this occasion. I would like to single out, at great risk, the PAC president. Mzwanele Nyonzo, Secretary General Apa Powe, uh, Azapo President Nelvis Kegema, uh, Puti, uh, we have Siavuigu Bona again uh, uh, visiting us at university, the Azapo National Chairperson Simpiwe Hashe, um, and uh, I understand there's a Limpopo Chairperson, I've not seen the Limpopo Chairperson. Pizom Pasha, Eastern Cape Chairperson Sandile Gokwana, and then I saw Azania earlier on, um, Jali, uh, the Eastern Cape Secretary Pula Lunake, the PUM Kuzo, uh, the PAC Chief of Staff. Ngiz Kolisele Kulu, if you call Nabanya and Gazang and Babiz and Amakama, we are all very much uh, welcome with great respect and humility uh, at this university. I also want to recognize my colleagues, uh, the members of the university executive uh, here, my deputies, uh, I've already mentioned Muki, uh, Professor Andre Kiet, uh, the DVC for, people, for Engagement and Transformation, Lutando Jack, the DVC for People and Operations, and uh, I, want to also recognize other members of the executive that have not seen, as well as all our staff members, Gezika um, Bazabo, uh, the numerous friends and visitors, the members of our government that are here uh, from all the spheres of government, uh, the academics, uh, all our staff, our students, led here by the Student Representative Council this evening, the deans of our faculty. I would also like to welcome the learners, the teachers from several high schools here in Kebeha and Kareha who are attending this lecture. I would like to um, really uh, praise young people for coming uh, in numbers as they usually do in our events uh, because this is a teaching moment for us when we celebrate uh, the doyens uh, of our struggle who contributed so much to what we now enjoy. I would like to extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, Ms. Libohang Pico. Uh, Libohang, we know her very well, uh, not just as a public intellectual, but also a scholar of distinguished uh, uh, status as well as the friend of our university. She will shortly be introduced by the acting dean of the faculty, Professor Heloise Satora. So I'm not going to introduce you myself, Lebo Hang, just to thank you sincerely for agreeing to be our keynote speaker. It is indeed fitting that you are the person that will deliver this lecture, given your own intellectual affinity and proximity to the work of Tata Umangaliso Sobugwe. We are really looking forward to your lecture this evening. A warm welcome is also extended to Professor Simpiwe Sisanti from University of the Western Cape, who has agreed to be our respondent this evening. Of course, I'm smiling because uh, Professor Simpiwe Sisanti has been our professor for a long time, and then he remains very connected with our university, even though he is uh, working in the Western Cape University. Simpiwe is no stranger to us, so we thank you very much, Simpiwe, for coming uh, to do this task this evening. Uh, I just want to remark briefly about the significance uh, of this lecture to us at Nelson Mandela University. This Robert Mangali Sosobugwe lecture is taking place, as Muki has said, 100 years since his birth in 1924, December. It takes place in the context 
of a number of events which are forming part of commemorative initiatives of a century uh, of Sobugwe and its sheer significance uh, for South African history and its liberation trajectory. It is both apt and opportune that we as Mandela University converge here this evening to reflect on the life and contribution of one of South Africa's finest sons. This lecture is also taking place 30 years since the watershed elections of 1994 that marked a transition from white minority rule under apartheid to a constitutional democracy whose foundational basis is indeed our constitution, the rule of law, freedom, equality, and human rights. It is inevitable and indeed appropriate that the celebrations of 30 years of democracy should be tempered by reflection on the life, contribution, and philosophy of Robert Mangaliso Sobugwe, especially in the times that we find ourselves in as a nation. I hope the engagement tonight will contribute reflectively uh, on these matters that I'm not going to go into because it is not my place. We are proud that our university has facilitated this critical engagement platform. Among the questions confronting us today are, has Robert Sobugwe's contribution to our liberation been sufficiently understood and appreciated and affirmed? Is his legacy narrated fully and accurately? What do his life, legacy, and ideas mean for our nation today. It is moments like these that afford our university, Nelson Mandela University, the opportunity to advance our ambition to offer a life-changing educational experience, as well as to deepen our own commitment to be a socially embedded institution that is in service of society. The Robert Sobugwe Institutional Public Lecture, which is intended as a biennial event at our university, speaks to our commitment to being an engaged and transformative university. Through this lecture, we can all reflect on the teachings and meanings of Robert Mangaliso Sobugwe and the promise it still holds today for a more just and fairer world to which he dedicated all his life. Catalyzing such platforms for critical engagements strikes at the heart of what universities are for and what universities should be doing if they want to be outward facing. In this regard, I am reminded of the important statement about memory and remembrance made by Nguki Watioko on occasions of the fourth Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture in 2003, when he reminded us of the need to pay attention to what and to what, how we remember. And he said, and I quote from him, colonialism tried to control the memory of the colonized. It tried to subject the colonized to its memory, to make the colonized see themselves through the hegemonic memory of the colonizing center, and I close quotes. In conclusion, I would like to conclude my brief welcoming remarks with a quotation by Mangaliso Sobugwe, a prof as he was affectionately known, that speaks directly to our own educational philosophy as Nelson Mandela University. For those that are not aware, as a university, we aspire to be a great African university that we distinguish ourselves by our ethos of a humanizing pedagogy. Uh, this has great resonance with one of Sobugwe, Sobugwe's own famous statements when he addressed his contemporaries at Fort Hare in 1949. He said, we breathe, we dream, we live Africa because Africa and humanity are inseparable. We breathe, we dream, we live Africa because Africa and humanity are inseparable. With that thought, program director and honored guests, I would like to again 
warmly welcome you to Mandela University. And we very much look forward to a spirited and intellectual, intellectually stimulating evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, VC. We are now welcomed. Singakulu Libaiki, Sonwa, Bekelakanjala Baiki is now a track by a donkey. You can take off your jackets. You are welcome. VC has spoken. Africa and humanity are inseparable. Wow. Thank you. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, request the Faculty of Education Student Choir to come on stage and entertain us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for the evening. Lebukhang Dipolo Peko. Her areas of research specialization include international trade and international economics in the context of South-North relations. It also includes political economy, regional integration of African states, feminist economics, international development, international relations in relation to African positionality, migration and globalization. And she is committed to grounding academic research in community struggles and praxis. She has taught at universities as a visiting faculty member across South Africa, Sweden, the UK, Zambia, Mexico, and the United States. She is also a member of the Walter and Patricia Rodney Commission on Reparation and is leading the South African chapter on the political economy of reparation. Lebu Khang is also the senior research fellow at feminist, activist and advocacy think tank. She is also a Lancet Commissioner on Reparation and an Ambassador 
of the well-being economy at Global Alliance. Lebohang takes guidance and inspiration from the her stories of the women who have and continue to resist all forms of imperialism. She is deeply committed to excavating memory and decolonized history that rebel against official narratives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Lebohang Tipolo Peko to the podium. Sons and daughters of the soil, Azanian children, African people in this southern tip of Africa, one day to be called Azania. I would like to appreciate this institution for having the courage, the vision to participate in voicing the voiceless and in seeing the unseen and remembering the unremembered. I would like to appreciate the Sobukwe family who are present and absent for the tree of knowledge, of wisdom, of courage that they have left us to stand under its shade. I would also like to appreciate the president and the leadership of Ntate Sobukwe's political home, the Pan-Africanist Congress, and the leadership of Azapo. I would also like to appreciate each of us for coming to be part of this meditation, this thinking, this reflection on who we are and who we could be when we consider our circumstances within the context of Ndate Mangaliso Sobukwe, a wonder, a miracle, a leader of no peer. Dumelang Sanibonani Molweni. The title of this meditation is Defying the Undefiable, a meditation on reparative memory. And this is really to say that because there's so little that has been recorded vocally on Ndate Sobukwe, we are forced to piece together what we imagine influenced him, what we imagine influenced the circumstances of his death of, and of his birth, and what we imagine he may have spoken into the ether of today's context. I begin by saying that on 27 February 1978, a message reached us in that funny little country, that place called Exile, that told us that a giant tree had fallen. I was a tiny child, but I understood that something of significance had occurred and that someone of the greatest stature had been wrought from this life to the next. In this opening meditation, I remind us of the countless speculations that abound over the disappearance of Ntate Sobukwe's archive and his voice. Some argue that the apartheid administration intentionally made sure that there could be no remnant, no detection of the bacteria of Africanism that he had infected the nation and indeed the nations with. Others believe that due to the potential to incite and to insurrect, 
there had to be a way of ever banishing him, not only in life, but in perpetuity. The emancipation of all Africans in South Africa and in what I call global Africa might have been accelerated under the sound of that voice. But the good news is that my Africa, we are here. And for as long as we are here, we can also give voice. You know, in many languages, many African languages, including Sisutu, including Sizulu, when we say Lekai, Lekai ka Sisutu, people take it to mean, how are you? It means, where are you? Where are you situated? Lekai. And then we respond and say, retain. Meaning what? We are here. We are where? We are here. Now you can imagine that if a person's voice is in a void, we have no way of situating where they are, nor of situating where we are. And when we say sanibonani, or saubona, what are we saying? We see you. We acknowledge you. You are a person. You are an embodied being. That is why we find it as African people offensive. When you just walk in and you just sit, how chinics? Hmm? And you ask yourself, am I not a person? Am I not seen? And the ethic of remembrance is accompanied by the political ethic of rehumanizing black people by seeing and by hearing. So by removing and erasing a voice, it means we refuse to see and to hear. But again, we are here to re-embody Ntate Mangali Sosobukwe. He will not be silent whilst we are standing. So the meditation on memory suggests a few things. That memory is a multifaceted idea. It is sometimes fragile. It is often contested. It is frequently tainted by power, by position, by positionality, by race, by Eurocentricism. It is often tainted by expediency, by convenience, sometimes by a sense of shame and a quest for glory. And it is related, undoubtedly, to the ones who have the strongest ink. Wars have been reinvented and entire civilizations erased by the stroke of one pen. The most potent parts of a nation's memory are often wielded by those with the most power and the most voice, and clearly, the most ink. There are very instances where recollections of the majority can be assumed to have been considered in official narratives and accounts of how we came to be, how we came to be here, and what actually occurred. But surely memory is an account of things remembered from the past, and history being the study of that past. The convergence between memory and history is then a very politicized one. If you've ever heard in a courtroom, people say, okay, what was the witness wearing? No, they were wearing a shirt. Then somebody will say, no, 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 but the shirt was green. But somebody else will say, no, the, the shirt was lemon. No, but somebody else will then say, no, the shirt was lime. Or Muni Uzoti, actually, no, the shirt was gray. Because in J, what is color and what is memory? It is the constellation of our preferences, of our ideation, of our wishes, and sometimes of our comfort levels. So even one account of things can have multiple ways and roots to being remembered. Where we fail as nations is in assuming that there is only one path to recollection, and that the one with the most ink is the most reliable path. So here we think about memory as an alive organism, as tangible, 
as breathing, as being something that we're always in dialogue with, which is why we'll get excited when we hear a new piece of information, because sometimes our history is actually in the future. We find new information. We find different narratives. We find different approaches, which cause us to look backwards completely differently, in a fresh way. So where memory is living and tangible, particularly where the events are relatively proximate, like settler colonial apartheid, like the Gulf War, like the Rwandan genocide, there is a greater space to wrestle between multiple stories. And this is where the reparative aspect must come into play. When we speak of reparative memory, we don't only repair the single path, we prepare a path for multiple possibilities. In this instance, memory is an ethical position. It is a space and a place where we wrestle with the best idea of who we imagine we are and challenged sometimes by the hard truths of our actions. Now, the colonial question offers many examples and opportunities for people and nations to explore multiple narratives. And this typology of colonial narratives has been divided between paternalistic colonial apologetics that suggests that the roads and the schools that the empires left behind were some kind of a compensation for illegal and immoral land occupation, acts of genocide, and the amputation of entire cultures and memories of nations. Will we allow Ndate Prof Sobukwe to be part of that amputation for any longer? Will we continue to allow him to be part of the erasure of our memory? Will we continue to allow him and Mezon Deni Sobukwe to continue in banishment even beyond this life? So because of the challenges of finding Ndate Prof's voice and his ability to say legai for himself, it falls upon us and occasions like this to try and situate him. So we have to design a quasi-fictional Ndate Sobukwe under these circumstances. We imagine an Ndate Sobukwe to preserve his ideas and assure their relevance to our current struggles. This, this we know. We know that he was born in Khrafrinet, like our DVC here, Mkayawake. We know that he was the youngest child of Ndate Hubert and Angelina Sobukwe. We know that his father was from Lesotho who worked as a general store clerk and a part-time wood cutter. And we know that Ndate Sobukwe's mother, Me Angelina, or Queen Mother Angelina, was a domestic worker in European homes. On the occasion of Ndate Prof's birth in 1924, several things were happening. And I'd like to suggest that none of these things are coincidences in the context of what was in the ether, and what was written in the stars of his life. The one was that the Native Urban Areas Act of 1923 had just been passed to enforce segregation in urban residential areas and implemented influx control to limit African people's entry into cities. And by 1926, when Barry Hetzog suggested expanding the reserve zones. He had also excluded black voters in the Cape from the common role. Another thing that was happening was that in Johannesburg, the implementation of apartheid colonial segregation had allowed the government to limit investment 
by treating, by creating uneven living conditions across the city, and again, ensuring a steady supply of an urban workforce. And this technique was thoroughly uh, part of the implementation of this 1923 Native Urban Areas Act. This voiced opposition from both African residents and landlords, as well as the manufacturing classes, mainly European settlers, who preferred to have Africans stay closer to their workplaces, not at our convenience. The egregious, the egregious nature of this becomes clearer as what we now know to be apartheid spatial planning was entrenched and remains with us. So by the time we fast forward uh, almost 40 years to the Sharpeville and Langa Pass actions, we can see that that was the beginning of the seeds of the rehumanizing of the most dehumanized. Rehumanization is one of the most fundamental projects of reparative memorialization by centering black people's personhood as the primary consideration. To make visible, to make audible, to make tangible the full dimensions of personhood, particularly where imperial lenses have contorted us into whispers and shadows of other people's imagination because habariboni they see as they wish to see there is no okay it is we think therefore you are and in this popular perception bear in mind as well that 1924 was also considered a significant moment in this settler south african history Herzog government was, uh, was a white workers' government opposed to the interest of mining capital, and it had been weakened. It did not launch the type of campaign that supporters of the then British Empire were interested in. In fact, Herzog gained power by forming strange alliances with, with what was then the, the British, the Labour Party, the South African Labour Party, who were known in these parts as the English white Bolsheviks, a strange alliance. And although the Labour Party was limited under the continuance of union under the British flag as a result of uh, Herzog's Republican leanings, it has to be said that the unrighteous pact contains in it the United Party. It also was then the residue of what became a liberal party, which is then what became the Progressive Party, which would be an antecedent, a precursor of what is today known as the Democratic Alliance. Ma Africa, far be it for me to prescribe where anybody should place their ex. But please be aware of the ancestral energies that are carried by this movement and their own ongoing manifestations. <laughs> and some of these ancestral energies include the Balfour Report, as represented by the Committee on Inter-Imperial Relations during the 1926 Imperial Conference in London, which again, um, Um Herzog signed on to. And this revised rela the relationship between Britain, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and what was called the Irish Free State. And yet, it stated that all its dominions were constitutionally equal. And yet, because history doesn't happen in a vacuum, its predecessor, which was the Balfour Declaration, legitimated settler colonialism in Palestine in 1917, as ratified by the League of Very, Very Despicable Nations in 1920. 
22. Please be aware of that ancestral energy. At this same time, there were gatherings of the Pan-Africanist movement and the Pan-African movement throughout the world. So while the imperialists were busy wringing their hands over how to entrench empire, African people were, as always, as we have today, gathering around the world. And the importance of these interwar, and I say that with caution, those were not world wars, those were, of course, European tribal wars, um, but the, in, the importance of those um, inter-European war congresses is largely acknowledged, primarily due to its formal connection with the Fifth Pan-African Congress, but also if we go back to the era around which Ntate Sobukwe was born, there are many scholars that believe that the two congresses were basically maintained of 1921 and 1923 that took place in, in Paris and London, um, were basically uh, the, the concept of an, uh, of, an, of an oppressed group to eliminate discrimination. It also needs to be said that these gatherings had immense influence on liberation movements globally. So we, have, we know about our Du Boises, we know about our Sylvester Williams, we know about our George Padmores and others. As late as 1974, another titan, Walter Rodney, the Guyanese historian adopted by Tanzania, noted that the main goal of Pan-African Congresses before 1945 was just to persuade colonizing powers to act more responsibly, humanely, more lovingly, in their colonial approach. But afterwards, there was a deeply radicalized tone to those congresses. And I'll read what many of them said, um, especially after the epic congress that took place in 1927, organized, by the way, by women like Dora Cole Norman, like Jesse Redman, like Dorothy R. Peterson, because as always, women must be written back into her story and our story. And like the South African scholar earlier on, um, May Alice Kinlock, from here, Kimberley, short left, our very own, who was part of the London edition. Um, and what these, uh, the resolutions of the 1927 Congress were, were this a voice in their own, and at the time, to coin the, the, the language of the time, Negroes everywhere need a voice in their own government. Native rights to the land and its natural resources. Modern education for all children. The development of Africa for the Africans, not merely for the profit of Europeans. The reorganization of commerce, and industry so as to make the mo main object of capital and labor the welfare of the many rather than the enriching of the few. Did someone say BEE in 1927? The treatment of civilized, they say men, people, as civilized despite differences of birth or race or color. They might as well have been sitting here next to us in 1924 or 2024. And this was written 100 years ago. So this is the ether, the atmosphere. These are what were the energies that were constellating around the time that this mighty tree was born. And I want to believe that maybe in a supernatural metaphysical way, these energies fed Me Angelina in the womb and that perhaps Umangaliso was swimming in those possibilities, somehow understanding that there's a global African liberation movement that is at stake, and that needs to be grounded in this land currently known as South Africa. Then we come to uh, Prof's coming of age in the era of settler colonialism and some of the influences of his early conscientization. 
So in, by 1948, his second year at uh, Forte saw the awakening of his uh, political consciousness. And there were several influences and uh, that influenced his conscientization. And one of them was the study of the laws that controlled Africans. The study of the movement of people the study of the encampment of African people in the name of Bantu administration. Now, those of us who understand our history will be aware that Verfut, our other favorite Um, was the father of sociology in this country. Ne? He studied psychology. He then went to so-called Rhodesia with his parents, the missionaries, it's always the missionaries. Eva got Bible, pam, 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 right? And then he came back, and you know the interesting thing about him was that this, dad, this, this Afrikaans nationalist was not even proper Afrikaner. He was Dutch. So this person was actually a model migrant trying to ingratiate himself into an Afrikaner uh, sensibility. The significance of this is that he then goes to Stellenbosch. He then becomes um, the, the, the founding faculty, head of department there after studying psychology. And then indeed, what we now understand to be the Stellenbosch group or the Stellenbosch ideology, he then foments it. Now, I say this to say Ma Africa, that there was nothing coincidental, incidental. This was well planned. And hence, not only did he understand the study of psychology and human behavior, he understood the study of society. So when we people say that, oh shame, they didn't understand what settler colonialism was. Make no mistake, it was understood very clearly. And why? So by the time Ntate Sobukwe is engaging with this native administration, it is a template that was designed with the intent to curtail, to dehumanize, to unsee, and to remind African people on this soil, Huriluna, you are here at our behest and at our leisure. Okay. So indeed, Ntate Sobukwe was so shocked that on one of, at one of his addresses at Fort Hare, he said this, we have chosen African nationalism because of its deep human significance, because of its inevitability and necessity to world progress. World civilization will not be complete until the African has made his full contribution, until we are seen and heard. Lekai. We are where? Here. In the space of this time, decolonization was also happening. Um, and it occurred simultaneously with the emergence of the Cold War, which again had nothing to do with us. Between the Soviet Union and the United States. Shame. Us in the middle. And decolonization was frequently influenced by this superpower rivalry and it had a clear effect on the development of such rivalry. It also had a profound effect on the overall landscape of international relations. So for example, you would have countries like the Soviet Union choosing to support African countries um, in their struggles to show that they were not colonizers, to show that they were better than Europeans, to show that born, they are not like those other Europeans. But in practice, there's very little difference. Now when we then, in the midst of all of that, we as an African bloc and the new independent blocs, um, countries like India and then immediately after that Pakistan, decided that we had no interest in being part of this football of so-called global powers, which were really two Western powers. Bandung, for example, the Bandung project was part of deciding that we need to have political self-determination. 
We need to have mutual respect for sovereignty, non-aggression, non-interference in national matters. And we bear in mind that the early sponsors of these Bandung project and the Nine Align movements were leaders like Nehru, were leaders like uh, Jomo Kenyatta, were leaders like, uh, you know, were leaders like the gentleman from Egypt, somebody help me, NASA, NASA, yes. Those were the leaders that were thinking beyond these boundaried areas of being the tool of, uh, of, of Western powers. So I wonder what then in that context a person like Ntate Sobukwe would say about a modern day President Ruto of Kenya choosing to be utilized to go and be a proxy soldier, tin soldier, for America's war in the Caribbean, wearing a Kaunda suit for that matter. And it is at this time when, in fact, the fascist tyranny had reached its zenith here, and African people's loyalty was being competed for. And that this Obukwe provides an answer and says, our answer, Mr. Speaker, and children of the soil, has been given by African leaders of the continent. Dr. Nkrumah has repeatedly stated that in international affairs, Africa wishes to pursue a policy of positive neutrality, allying herself to the, neither of the existing blocs, but in the words of Dr. Nandi Akizwe, Azikiwe of Nigeria, remaining independent in all things, but neutral in none that affect the destiny of Africa. What follows is what I've titled here, the moment of truth and untruths. After the National Party and our sociologist, Umver Wood, gained power in 1948, uh, initiating the formalization of 300 years of colonial settler rule through the implementation of what is politely called apartheid, although it is much, much deeper. This possession is much deeper than the apartheid policies. The ANC responded to the increasing apartheid system by adopting the multiracial and proto-human rights manifesto known as the, the Freedom Charter in 1955. This led to criticism, as we are all aware, and disagreement from the Africanist faction within the organization. And in 1955, the great rupture from the ANC as a result of the land question emerges being viewed as a betrayal of the big program of action. And in the Africanist, as it was said at the time, the nature of the struggle, as Sir Bukwe puts it, he says, for Africanists, the struggle is both nationalist and democratic in that it involves restoration of land to its rightful owners, the Africans, which fact immediately divides the combatants into the conquered and the conqueror, the invaded and the invader, the dispossessed and the dispossessor. That is a national struggle. It has nothing to do with numbers and laws, and might I add, with swimming pools and sitting on a park bench with white people. It is a fact of history, and both sides are each held together by that common history that are in the struggle, carrying out this task imposed by history. That task is for the whites, the maintenance and retention of the spoils passed on to them, by the forefathers, and for the Africans, our task is the overthrow of that foreign yoke and the reclamation of the land of our fathers. So by 1960, when in Dade Peter Raburoko, a member of the PAC and later an advisor and a speech writer to Ndate Kwame Nkrumah, by the way, explain the distinction between the Charter and the PAC Manifesto. Um, and, and, and he stated that the Cliptown Charter of 1955 represented both black and white people, whilst the 1959 Africanist Declaration represents 
the African people as part of a unified African nation. Now, in all of this, the influences of Africanism on Ndate Sobukwe, including some of the people and the forces and the energies that I have already named, including Kuruma, Kometure, and others, um, it is important to consider Sobukwe and the PAC's fundamental stance and historical context in connection with the broader advancement in anti-colonial movements. Uh, during this period, there was an increasing criticism in the 1950s and 60s of Western values, colonial influences, with a focus on what Kwame Nkrumah called African personality, what Kenneth Kaunda called humanism, what Julius Nyerere called Ujama. And African leaders and theorists were making ongoing efforts to comprehend the connection between individuals and the larger community, as well as to formulate a philosophy and philosophical anthropology of this movement. And Ndate Sobukwe's voice was key in that movement. And yet, here we are, the erasure of Ndate Sobukwe's voice, not only at that time, but seemingly in perpetuity. It is an act of commission and an act of enduring and deliberate violence. Several people and scholars, I will not name them, that would be tacky, but those who know will know, who ought to know better and do better, continue to activate and implement the odious Sobukwe flaws related to Ndate Sobukwe's legacy by addendumizing him and his remembrance with references to whom he might have been if he had continued in the same camp as Mr. Mandela, Mr. Tambo, and Mr. Sisulu. And I say that with greatest respect for this great institution, which is named after Ndate Mandela. His intellectual achievements, life works, and significant intellectual contributions being overlooked, unknown, and indeed continually banished. So this is the sound of silence. That Ndate Sobukwe and Mezondeni Sobukwe have been rendered, named as silent, private, somehow unknowable, even to those who knew them and know of their work and singular life. I'd like to quote a previous speech I made on the occasion of Mezondeni's lecture to say it is not the kind of silence that comes from fear. It is not the silence that comes from being told too many times that you don't know better or that your opinions don't matter. It is a contemplative silence and intentional silence. It is a silence where you learn about things that you don't know about. It is a silence that makes you think before you speak, and if you cannot think, it renders you unspoken. It is a silence that teaches you to respond or not react, a silence that is directed towards the interior. It is a silence that shows you that you will never speak your way into somebody's heart, mind, soul. Because there's nothing to prove where there's nothing that can be said. These are the silences of unnaming, of namelessness, false naming, renaming, omission, and lying. It is misallocation of glory or significance that belong to someone and is given to another section, sector, movement, individual. This is in line with my ongoing meditation and concern with the officializing of history and her story. The insistence that we take one path to knowing ourselves and to knowing herselves and themselves. People who have muffled people's voices and writings, some of the many ways that we have contributed and struggled to tell stories, particularly women and men in this case, um, critique literacy programs, record our histories, our histories, publish our truths, create networks, and even revise languages to meet this end. Some of the ways through which enforcement of hierarchies, media control, and anti-establishment educational policies are into what I call censorship 
and state-led imperialist terrorism on our minds. So visibility is part of repairing our memory to see the unseen. And they are very key to my understanding of decoloniality and the necessary repair. With visibility comes remembrance. And remembrance because memory is in some sense necessary before we can address and be offered any justice for the injustices. Memory makes the past present. It makes it possible for the past to be addressed. The functionality and the flaws of memory have long been studied and documented, and yet the politics of memory with regard to the crimes committed on Ndate Sobukwe's voice are infinite. Um, and indeed, it is necessary to find a balance between this obsession with the past, and I think it is a righteous obsession, and the attempts to impose forgetfulness on us. But again, the notion of silence cannot be spoken of without the coexisting silence of Ndate Sobukwe and Mezondeni Sobukwe. Their words never captured for posterity, and his voice deliberately silenced, and even now we are shielded from his thoughts and bold philosophy. What have we lost by not hearing Ndate Sobukwe's voice? What have we been cost? What amount of reclamation, restoration, recognition has been lost by delinking Ndate Sobukwe from himself and disembodying him? Because that's a very Western Eurocentric mechanism for control, where knowledge can only be embedded in an individual, whereas Rona, we understand that this village, this town, this nation can carry the legacies of others. What have been lost by this vocabulary of his, of liberation? Was that his voice? <laughs> I'll forgive it. <laughs> but how indeed it plays a crucial role in what we might have known as cultural norms. What is the harm that has been done to us by not knowing and hearing him? What has been the harm that has been done to us by devaluing his personhood, his dignity, not only pre-1994, but post-1994. Hmm? We speak about this assumption that natives were non-human, terra nullius, empty land. Hmm? Yes. As popularized by one of my favorite people in the world, in that Peko, terra nullius. But even in that Sobukwe, is he also an empty space? Devoid of meaning and banishment. Hmm? So how do we cancel these silences? We create, we reconstruct, we enforce every time we speak, we think, we look, we breathe. These memories are walking, talking. They are the shared recollection of who we are, where we have been. They are not a single stream of consciousness. And indeed, there is nothing as ugly as an instrument to enforce, to silence. That goes under the notion of officialdom. These canons remain incomplete and complicit in marginalizing and further dispossessing voices like in Tate Sobukwe. What is the cost? What would it cost to fix that psychologically, spiritually, intellectually, let alone politically. And this inquiry of memory must be accompanied by an underlying discomfort that memory is going to be subjective. It is going to be chauvinistic, which is why we need many of them to contest, to meet, to dialogue with each other. It cannot be one way 
this way or the highway. There must be many highways to finding ourselves because that is the ethical memory framework. And it must transfer not only political and economic power, but also the sovereignty of, econo of, of memory and African identities. And in closing, I say from Datesobukwe and Emesobukwe, it requires an end to ongoing vandalism of their essence the amputation of our collective psyche. Because for as long as they are silenced and unseen and unheard, we are not complete as a people. It renders us incomplete, it renders us incoherent, and it renders us unwhole, whether or not we are aware of this unwholeness. So I'll close with my late favorite, one of my other favorite people, and that is Don Matera when he said no dirges, let no dirges be sung, let no shrines be raised to burden his memory. Sages such as he need no tombstones to speak their fame, lay him down on a high mountain that he may look on the land that he loved, the nation for which he died. Thank you so much. And thank you, um, Ms. Lebohang Peku, for your resounding words. We were in a class. This is a master class. History, her story, political science, sociology, anthropology, philosophy, giving voice remembering erasure, cancellation of silences, dispossession, vandalism of essence, the amputation of our psyche. Thank you so much. Without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Professor Satora to come and introduce our respondent. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also honored to have in our midst Professor Simpiwe Sesante, who will be our respondent this evening, and who will reflect on the thought-provoking presentation given by our speaker. Simpiwe Sesante is a professor at the University of the Western Cape in the Faculty of Education. He's a former editor of the International Journal of African Renaissance Studies. He holds two PhDs, one in journalism studies obtained from the University of Stellenbosch and another in philosophy. <laughs> Sorry. 
We're not going to say anything, Prof, about Stellenbosch. <laughs> and another PhD in philosophy from the University of the Witwatersrand. He has taught at Stellenbosch University's journalism department, at the Nelson Mandela University's um, department of journalism as well, media and philosophy, and at the University of South Africa's Institute for African Renaissance Studies. He has published in accredited journals on a variety of issues, including education, African philosophy, gender, journalism, politics, and spirituality. In 2018, he was awarded an NRF rating C2. Ladies and gentlemen, please let us welcome Prof. Sempiwe Sasante to the podium. and kept him alive. They are law that killed him. Let no dedges be sung, no shrines be raised to bed in his memory. Men such as he need no tombstones to lay their fame. Lay him on a high mountain so that he may look on the land he loved, the nation he died for. Men fear the fire of his soul. Igamaga kamate lakshala linguene. Igamala ke lakshala linsoni. Gokba ngumta longa chongwai. Gokba ngumta longo la chwai. Sonde legu nike bokoko. Snu legu nike minyani. Sitis tetu se na masigo inu. Mawa ke gazletu. Tulani mitanjini etu. Ukabisa ukoku etu. Shaziani is known in Zet, Ozas Bassis Sizwe. Did his only film near my booming beach, who Veleuku Kain. Sniggin a maton was some blue glayo, that was the impil on the Tamsan. Gogba Mans and Nikunya Lilin, Mastini Kama. Dio Yiga Zizu as summer commas in his Awa Kennebes, the Gokuku, the Gostonga Sadders of Gatogana Masat is Oka, Mastini Kama. Yo yika zizu za sima chonye ni za kwa tigiza za kwa sawa za kangu wa moza kwa mtuzi melo kungwa masteni kama. Yo yika zizu za sima chawe ni za kwa chiwa za kwa kauta za kwa palo za kwa togo za kwa putaman za kwa palo za ungyama na za kwa ngosi ya mtu masteni kama. Yo yika zizu za sima nda kweni ni za kwa chebele ni za kwa mintuka za kwa libele za kwa kanga shema masteni kama. Yo yika zizu wa sese tatu ni za kwa ndebeza kwa kisa na za kwa kopo yi masteni kama. Yo yika zizu asema zangweni za kwa kalo za kwa ngutu za kwa mlanja na za kwa soo besa za kwa ngale za wangume za kwa maliki za kwa kula za kwa nikuwa ndo maseni kamago. Yo yika bo koko bam yo yika. Yo yika chamba send yo yika. Lisa msu utu yo yika izango mfelwe ni yo yika. Dikela nindo lmelezela matolo wa maya keveze la maseni kamago. Master Maxim. Maseni kamago. Comrade, dear Pulo, I'm afraid. I'm literally afraid and my throat is getting dry. I'm literally afraid. I was trained as a journalist, Comrade, dear Paul. Now, in journalism, one of the things that we are told, taught is no taking. So I should be very efficient in note taking. But today I wasn't able to do so. Because you came up with so many issues, I became confused. <laughs> and that's why I'm so much afraid. But I've asked the ancestors, I've invoked them, and I've asked them to give me the necessary strength. Revolutionary greetings, Madam VC, together with all the VCs and the program director, and all the leadership that is here with us today. And Comrade Diepolo is raising a very important question, that being that where would we be? What is it that we have lost? 
what is it that we still need to, re to reclaim? And having said that, comrade dear Paul, let me perhaps begin at the beginning. Because if I do not begin at the beginning, I'm going to be lost. A number of years ago, it may have been two or three, I do not quite recall, but I had a, a conversation with Comrade Alan Zinn this morning just to make sure that I'm not off the track. We need to, to put history in its context. And that being that the fact that we are here today was through a persistent action by a woman who was leading in the Eastern Cape or perhaps in the Nelson Mandela region. This lecture has not always been there. But Comrade Kosi Makatuk visited the office of Comrade Alan Zin and kept on knocking persistently until this lecture became a reality. Now I know that many in this, in this audience here often quote Franz Fanon. And when they quote Franz Fanon, inevitably they say that every generation has got a mission to discover. It is up to that generation to betray or to fulfill that mission. That is always that you will get from the comrades and nothing else from Franz Fanon. As if that is all that Franz Fanon ever said. But Franz Fanon has said many things and things that are significant. One of the things that Franz Fanon has taught us is that it is very important to acknowledge those who came before us. We should not ever pretend that everything began with us. We stand tall today because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And that was one of the things that we must remember about Franz Fanon. And I'm speaking directly to the point that you're making, Comrade Diapolo, about memory. What is it that we remember? And what is it that we choose to forget? It is very significant. It was by no accident of history. This is the second memorial lecture of Mangali Sosobukwe at the Nelson Mandela University. It is. The second, the first speaker, and this is very significant, was Comrade Christine Kunda. Christine Kunda was, as we should know, a woman. The initiator of this public lecture is or was a woman. The first person who delivered it was a woman. And the second person without any interruption in between, is a woman. And that is telling us something about what the ancestors beyond the grave are telling us. That women, as they always have done, historically in Africa, must lead. Because men have messed up. <laughs> and I am a man. As they come. But men have learned very well from their European masters. In Europe, as you would read from the, from the book written by Aristotle, The Politics, women were not regarded as citizens. Women and slaves were regarded as properties who could not think, and only men were citizens. And therefore, patriarchy is a heritage of Europe that was imposed upon the African people. Patriarchy has got nothing to do with Africa and everything to do with Europe. And it is for that reason that Comrade dear Paul, you are here today and before you there was Comrade Christine and the one who initiated all of this 
was comrade Mike Mike Echuka Kosi, so that therefore men must begin to listen. And what is it that men learned from their European masters? And here we are going to speak about memory. They learned a lot of things. One of the things that they learned was that uh, when the European colonialists took the Africans from here to the Americas, one of the first things that they did was to rape African women, to devalue them, to humiliate them. As if that was not enough, they took African men to rape their women, thus to devalue them so that they could produce children, reproduce children of rape. And today, African men continue to rape African women. Even those that claim to be Pan-Africanists, they rape African women by marginalizing African women and not giving the necessary recognition to women and accepting them as leaders that they should be. How is it that in this movement of Mangaliso Sobu that taught us in the conduct of this organization that African women must be treated with dignity and respect? How is it that at no stage do we hear a significant conversation about the leadership of women? How does that happen? It is meet that we speak the truth while we are still alive. That was Mangaliso Sobukwe saying that. Sobukwe told us that we must be frank and he said to us, when he said that leaders in front, you know many of us have got a very mistaken notion of thinking that we are the liberators of the masses. Because of that mistaken notion, we have an illusion that we know it all. We think that we are the liberators and that the masses will follow us. And yet, Mangali Sosobukwe told us that it is the masses themselves who are going to liberate them. It was Mangali Sosobukwe said this. And so these are the things that you remind me of today, Comrade Diepo. I came here afraid, but as I'm beginning to remember Mangali Sosobukwe, I'm gaining some strength and Yabulel Kuchambas. Leaders in front, Mangali Sosobukwe told us, the concept of leadership in front in particular means that we or you, the leaders, are supposed to be the one who learn first. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot educate without learning. And many of us told Karl Marx, Mawazi Tung, and everyone else, but were we to be challenged to speak about the PAC case that Mangali Sosobukwe articulated? Were we are, are, are challenged to speak about the speech that he delivered, the inaugural speech? We are not able to deliver because we respected others and devalued ourselves. We sing of the ancestors of others and not about our own ancestors. And so therefore what this tells us is that the status campaign that was begun by the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania in 1959-1960 ended with the Sobukwes and was not carried on by and with the next generation. And that is why we are in the mess that we are today. And what is that mess? Mangali Sosobukwe taught 
that the liberatory creed is African nationalism. But that African nationalism which is on a pan-African basis. He told us that South Africa is no exception but an integral part of the African continent. And that all African people are one nation. But what has happened to us? We hear even those who are pan-Africanists. When they speak about fellow Africans, they refer to them as foreign nationals. How can it be that an African in Africa would ever be regarded as a foreigner? And those are the things that come to memory today, Comrade Diapon. And so then what happens? Mangali Sosobuko at the very age of 25, he says to us, let me plead with you, lovers of my Africa, to carry with you into the world a vision of a new Africa. An Africa reborn, an Africa rejuvenated, an Africa recreated, young Africa. Africa shall not retreat, Africa shall not equivocate, Africa shall not retrend, relent, remember Africa. And at that inaugural conference of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azani, Mangaliso Sobuko was saying, no, it was at Forte that he was saying this. He was saying that the student nurses were not with them, those women, on that day, because they were busy involved in a struggle. He said to us that Africa does not forget. And so it is appropriate that you marry memory and forgetfulness together because it was Bangali Sosobukwe himself that instructed us to remember. And if then we do remember, Comrade Diapolo, I heard you mentioning in passing, and this is a fact that is not appreciated by, by many of us, that we often speak about Sylvester Williams or W. D. Bois as the fathers of Pan-Africanism. And yet the truth of the matter is that Alice Kinlock, whom you mentioned, was the one who inculcated the idea into the head of Sylvester Williams. She it was that then the African Association was established so that we could have the first Pan-African Conference in 1900. Women were leading at that time. It was Amy Garvey at that crucial significant conference, the Manchester Conference in 1945, who was chairing the first chess session. The women were leading. Our ancestors have taught us in our own languages. That is because, you see, Comrade Dear Paul, when these people came, one of the things that they did to the African Americans was to rob them of their African languages. But even as we remain, us, with our own African languages, we have learned nothing. We are learning nothing. We know that one of the most important things in African culture, bububele, ubuntu, to be kind and hospitable to the wayfarers. But what are we doing? We are ravaging our own brothers and sisters who are coming from outside because we are afraid to confront the real issue. Our land has been taken from us because we're afraid of the masters. We're busy running around formulating policies about how to block our own African brothers and sisters who are running away from poverty and persecution. We are saying we must deal with them and deal with them now. Sitting side by side with those who took away our land. We call them our brothers and sisters. We kill those who look our eyes because we regard them as enemies. 
But let us remember. And comrade dear Paul, we are looking up to the sisters because African culture as creation has given them that responsibility. That we know that the word Ububele comes from the word Amabele. Amabele, give milk. Women are the first. Women are the first providers. They give. Women are the first protectors of all human beings. Women are the first teachers of all human beings. My sisters, men, like any oppressors in the world, Mangali Sosobuke said that we are not expecting any miracles to take place. Yes. White oppressors will not voluntarily step down from power. Historically, oppressors have always been forced to, to do so. It is not through the negotiations, the begging of men, trying to get them to understand that you must lead, that you will lead. You've got to take the bull by its horns. The saying in Hafor says, one minute left, that the penis scatters and the wounds Others. Literally, the penis scatters. <laughs> and the womb literally gathers. Men, through their ego, are raping, killing, literary, and otherwise. It is the women who will respond to Mangali Sosobukwe's call and take the necessary leadership forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the stage of the question and answer. Um, looking at the time, we're not going to take a lot of hands. Um, I would like to request that you keep your question as a question and not a comment. <laughs> Please, when you ask the question. So we're opening up. We still have to have the vote of thanks afterwards. So I would really appreciate if we you know, keep it short um, as we ask our guest speaker and respondent. We have roving mics. So as soon as you raise your hand, I will acknowledge you and then I'll take three 
hands at the moment. Please raise your hand. Don't you have any question? Okay. Oh, now I need to wear my glasses. I see you, sir. Tato Yanipa. Don't don't know the mic. Okay. And then is there another hand? No, I've, I've seen your hand. Which one? Oh, in the here. Number two? Now go number two. Okay, let's take those two. I'm, I'm not going to force you to ask questions. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening. Sia Bulela and a lecture. Um, uh, great weights of wisdom from he presented it. Um, my own question is like looking at now, looking at the past and looking at today. Um, can, in the context of uh, the professor has raised it, like xenophobia, like in that context of this xenophobia, this antagonism we have with our fellow Africans, um, I want to question, can pan-Africanism as a as a system of thought, a reckon today with neoliberalism. Um, why? Because neoliberalism, pan-Africanism promotes unity amongst Africans uh, in general in the diaspora, but neoliberalism tends to atom atomize people to, to, to the self-interested individual, maximizing. Uh, 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 so inherently trapping people, especially the poor working classes, in competition. So how do we reckon with neoliberalism as pan-Africanist? Thank you. Thanks, and we will take the second question. Yes. Is it true? Yeah. In Africa? Yes. Um, mine is brief, man. Um, oh, Professor Sensandi mentioned that it's a second lecture of Sobokwe in the University of Mandela. And also, we acknowledge that there are young people from uh, primary and high school. And the, the branding of the program is about Sobukwe. And I feel like the university, as much as doing a great work to, to, to do these lectures, but the branding of the program, we should see the portrait of pictures of Sobukwe. I understand Mandela is an icon of the university, but also, the mindset of young people who are still here, they will live understanding that this was Sobukwe, that is in the background. I feel like the university can do a better work to improve on that. That's number one. Because the oh, no, 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 no. I want to preamble where I'm getting to. Man. Sorry, man. The bone of contention was a contestation of history. Mayor Pego mentioned that um, memory is an ethical position, you know, and the biography and the history that tells who Sobukwe is and what Sobukwe represents. When we get here, the university is heavily armed. I understand we have dignitaries who are here, but also it is important to emphasize that the university is heavily armed because of this current ongoing of worker struggle currently. If we contest history, may, Professor Sobukwe met May uh, 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 Mamu Sobukwe Veronica in a protest of nurses. And, and, and if you are going to sit here and engage the ideas that emulate the leadership of Sobukwe, it must be thought provoking to us that we don't mention the heavy security that is dealing with this, the workers that are currently protesting now. Ma Of to, to assist men. I don't know how. Because I feel like when we're engaging in these ideas of what Sobukwe represents, are, are restricted to the academic level as, as a result that they are theorized in an abstraction level. Because it is very difficult to make sense of these ideas, understanding the unethical of the country we are currently living in understanding that South Africa is a polity is an idea that is built on disposition of black people's land. And the call for the restoration of black people's land is very centered to the politics that Sobukwe represented. Okay. So... Yo, can you get to the question, sir? I'm getting to my question. I understand this year there are national elections 
And there is a lot of degeneration of mainstream politics and the mobilization of black people in the basic issues like the electricity and water, not to confront the system and what Soboko represented. What would you advise the organizations that are still yet to try to garner for, for, for votes to mobilize people on ideas Soboko represented? You know, because of the current manifestos that we are getting now are not a reflection of what Sobogo was trying to achieve in, in the relation of the total liberation of black people. What would you advise for the organization? Because even Sobogo says that we espouse democracy as is espoused at West. So now this year is national general election. What would you advise the, the, the leftist bloc that are going to elections to represent the aspiration of black people. What can you advise, understanding that at 29th May, we are going to the election. Hopefully, everyone is registered to vote and make her Thank voice you. to be heard. All this right. will it. Thank you. We have those uh, two questions. Um, would you like to, to take the first question on pan-Africanism? and um, neoliberalism. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Force, for the question, because I think that we have been, we are, we are suffering a crisis of branding, of languaging, where developmental language and developmental constructs are being sold back to us by the World Bank, um, by the IMF. Uh, so you hear, you, know, you hear the idea of sustainability, you hear questions like democracy. You hear constructs that sound promising, even freedom. I mean, earlier on, Comrade Sassanti and I were speaking and saying even decoloniality and decolonization has been colonized oftentimes by Western or white thinkers. Right? So this antagonism between an Africanist ideal, and when we speak of Africanist, I want to lean a bit on what um, Sasanti was taught, Professor Simpira was saying about um, the idea of memorialization and community being part of how African people in this land of Azania how we construct society. There will always be a dissonance between the individualism and the individualistic ways in which Western neoliberal, including the memory sector, want to contain and want to recreate society. It is a challenge to us to diffuse that and to remind ourselves that this is, comes from a mentality of scarcity. And we have been told, particularly by the Western imperial imagination, we've been sold the lie that we are indebted, that we are a scar, that we are poor, that we are least developed, and language matters, right? It's, you know, it's ontological. It said it does something to us. And for as long as we are unable to undo a lot of that languaging and that colonial grammar, we will continue to believe that we are scarce. So neoliberalism says you have to pay for education. And I'm aware of many of the battles that are being fought even on this campus as we speak, both by students and by workers. It will continue to tell us that we can't afford um, free education. It will continue to tell us that you can't afford free health care, affordable health care. It will continue to tell us that we can't afford uh, you know, decent urban spatial planning that is dignified, that enables us to move safely from one place to the other with affordable public transport, for example. It will continue to tell us that load shedding is a fact of life and that if you are lucky and you're one of the haves or have mores that then you can just go and buy yourself a generator or better still Kenya solar your 50,000 rands completely come away from the grid and yet we don't even it, 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 it forgets that the majority of people in this country live load shedded lives and it is only a problem because the urban or the middle classes are now also little now now we are in the dark. But for all of these years, even pre, from 1994 until load shedding became nationalized. Nationalized. 
before our middle class privilege, before it became a mass class privilege. I see load shedding as the new class project because it, is, it reminds us that in the dark, there is no class differentiation. So that is my response to what, you know, to some of the lies and the, the ways in which neoliberalism is trying to frame this scarcity mentality as an inevitable reality. And yet we also know that from this continent, for every dollar that arrives, two or more leave. Akere. Through um, smuggling, um, through double, double invoicing, and so on and so on. There's nothing about poor Africa, let alone poor South Africa. So until we are able to rethink our means of production, to control the price of our, the cost of our own commodities, for example, it is ridiculous that the gold price is set somewhere, somewhere. And yet it is us who dig it in this country or in DRC, etc. And we're all complicit. For as long as we have a cell phone, a laptop, we are all complicit to different degrees. So we really need to rethink this idea that we are powerless, that we are voiceless. Even coffee prices, because of some old colonial construct, are set offshore. Not in Ethiopia, not in Kenya, not by coffee producers. So yes, neoliberalism wants to sell us the lie of scarcity, of powerlessness, of voicelessness. But we are not scarce by any stretch. That's all I can say for now. Well, Chief well, Richard, Comrade Peko, let me simply say that, and remember, let me begin with the, with the question on neoliberalism and, and pan Africanism and the so called xenophobia. I refuse to use the word xenophobia at all simply because when you say xenophobia, you say that it is the hatred and the fear of the foreigner. And so when you use that word, you're actually accepting the fact that Africans are foreigners. So I don't have the word um, to describe that hostility, but it is certainly not xenophobia, because Africans from whatever part of the African continent they are from are not foreigners. And so therefore, having said that, it is no accident of history that you may go to Ghana the first 51 to 1957, the responsible government, you go to Zimbabwe, they went to Lancaster House. Wherever the African people have shown heroism and heroism, when the settler forces are on the retreat, they've always wanted to negotiate with liberation movements. And what our the masses have worn, interestingly, Zephania Mutuping said, you cannot get on the negotiating table what you lost on the battlefield. But ironically, in our struggles, African people have lost on the negotiation table what they gained in the battlefield. Because we fought heroically and heroically, and on the table, our leaders were twisted and they accepted compromising arrangement that made them useless and powerless and unable to deliver to the African masses. As a result of the failure to deliver to the African masses, the African masses are at one another's throat. And so what then? Our leaders taught us that uh, when Pan-Africanism was articulated, that it has always been about the spiritual liberation, but also the economic liberation, that what is due to us must come back to us. You cannot, you can never, ever, ever have a sense of dignity. You know, Emma Kaya, Emma Kaya you talk and talk and talk about it. Your mother has died. They say, I want to shut up. In your own mother's thing, you can't discuss because you've got nothing. So people who do not have, do not have a sense of dignity. The same way that we are humiliating. So therefore, the, our ancestors politically have taught us that we must reclaim what is ours. And only when we have reclaimed what is ours can we begin to speak meaningfully. And so the, 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 the last question there um, has left me amused. And I'm going to be frank and honest because, you know, I cannot claim to be a follower of Mahalisa Sobuku and yet lie at the same time. Now, I do not qualify, comrade. I think you'd bring me shivers to ask me, but I'm <laughs> I do not qualify to advise the leadership 
of the Pan-Africanist Congress or even the membership of the Pan-Africanist Congress about what to do. Because I, when I was messed up by the enemy system, ably assisted by the traitors in the Pan-Africanist Congress, when they threw me in prison in Zimbabwe and treated me like nothing I cannot describe, I turned my back and I ran away. I wasn't like Sobuk. I did not persevere like Sobuk. I chose to walk away. And therefore, I'm in no position to sincerely say this is what must be done or this is what must be done unless I go back there with the masses and do not simply tell them what to do. I must be in the struggle and say let us do this together. Until then, I have no business, I have no authority to give any advice. Also, we must, be hum we must be humble and never ever think that any one of us, including the so-called educated like me, the professors, we do not have monopoly over knowledge and the truth. Mm. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that the school children are leaving because their transport is leaving. Okay, so you are excused. We're going to take just one, two hands. Two hands and then we'll be finished. That's you and you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Mike, ah, eh? Can you please raise your hand again, Tata? Thank you. This one I'll direct to uh, the lady. Uh, I, I was waiting for you to 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 uh, comment on because you've encapsulated, uh, you know, the, the entire spectrum of how things shaped out to be. Now I'm curious uh, about the current situation in, in in geopolitics, especially the China and the American co uh, what would be described as Cold War, but mainly is the my, my main concern. Uh, is what is happening perhaps in, in the Gaza and also our stance of taking Israel to the, 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 court, the international court and all of a sudden we are told that uh, the, the people who are leading us, they are spreading word that they are actually apprehensive that Israel is going to, 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 to you know, to, 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 to uh, English is, escapes me. Okay. <coughs> So my, my, my concern, how, how, how would you con contextualize our involvement currently in what is happening and what we actually should, be, which you should anticipate the, thereof? Okay. I hope I'm clear. Yeah, thank you. And then the second one, that's the last. Um, yes. Israel, too. Africa. Uh, it is meet that we speak the truth before we die. Each or elder. Number two, we cannot address any other question without addressing the land question. We have X and Y, Z rights, APC rights, LPG2 rights without addressing the land rights of the African. Now, my curiosity is based on this thing. Singama Africa, I think we have lost touch with the ground. The very same Africans that we advocate for that came from the other side of the continent. Deep down in the reality of the matter, as Lokshin Zetu, we are being disrespected by the very same Africans that we advocate for, that we welcomed in our own societies. This brings us to one position, that we have not addressed the land question, therefore we have our fellow Africans and neighbors who have come to occupy our own spaces bringing about economic uh, castration to the native South African of the land. This is the reality of the matter on the ground, regardless of whether you occupy higher echelons of the society, but on the ground, the reality is that the South African native is economically castrated. Now, number two, it is, psycho it is psychological violence that you do not even see 
one picture of Utatusobukwe on the forefront. It is psychological violence. Now, if you, if you look at the definition of, psycho, of psychological violence, you can see that in the township, there's no inspiration for you to thrive because the conditions themselves do not inspire you to become a better person. Now, my Africa, let us be clear. We can no longer have these conversations in these chambers without addressing the people on the ground because we will be occupying these positions, talking about Sobukwe, Biko, and everyone, while the masses of our people are there confronting the realities that we are discussing here in this, in, in this, in this room. So, Dianitela, my Africa, before we do anything else, let us be frank with the reality that faces our people. What the question then is, Kuteni constantly that we come here into these chambers, have these discussions, high level English, high level debates, without taking this discussion to the communities. Because we are from the communities. Economic castration of the South African native is real. No South African can own a spaza shop because our brothers from the other side of the continent have created syndicates for us not to thrive economically. Number one, because they are supported by the state itself, the police, the government, through its own policies that Tina as South Africans, we cannot trade. Selling is a skill. These people, these young people that are here, supposed to have that one passion, which is to sell their own craft, but we do not have that. All we do is become philosophical, talk high language and high level, at a higher level in these chambers. But the reality is, right. we are banning. There is economic okay. castration of the South right, African native in this land. So, sir, lastly, how can we address the land question without any confrontation of these LGBT, X, Y, Z, A, B, C questions? We need our land now, which is what Uso Wuku was advocating for. Ngoz. to respond first um, so that uh, Comrade Diepolo will have the last word because Franz Fanon tells us that the, the declaration of negation is not in itself negation. So I have to demonstrate in practice that I believe in women's leadership and Comrade Diepolo is going to have the last word as she had the first word. Now, um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the last speaker in what he said and the first response to him was that uh, he's riddled with contradictions. Because I would expect that in the first place, he would not come here and come to address us here. He would be on this day of Mangali Sosobu, who would be in the township, organizing the masses. But he simply could not resist coming here because they were going to be these people in this chamber. Now, let us move on and begin to say that you know, when we, we, we began moving into the PAC in our teens, we were told that Mangali Sosobu were taught that when you see water flowing from the tap, you do not go and remove the water that is a pool there. You go and close the tap first, and thereafter deal with water. And so basically, Mangali Sosobu was dealing with all the contradictions that we have amongst them, sellouts, traitors, and all of that, and because every revolution has got its own traitors. So if we keep on dealing with traitors and sellouts, we will never get to confront the enemy. And so the enemy must be the first that is dealt with. Um, and let me tell you, comrade, um, I was in Zimbabwe in my early teens. In the year that I was last there, a comrade of the PC was arrested, a leader of the PC was arrested for selling drugs. There were many of them who were doing so. They were not arrested as Arizanians, they were arrested as drug peddlers. And so there's no one of us saying here that Africans who mess up from, other, the, other, from the borders, when they do wrong things that are wrong, we must confront the wrongs that are being confronted. But we must not, having been dispossessed by the settler community, 
afraid of that settler community, not confronting that settler community, and confront our brothers and sisters and their children who are helpless and powerless. That is where the problem is. We do not turn a blind eye, you know, to all of that. And let me, comrade uh, chair, uh, comrade uh, DVC, um, as I sit down, really acknowledge and appreciate the fact that, as you were quite correctly saying, when this idea of um, uh, uh, arranging, of um, commemorating Sobukwe came, comrade Zin correctly said that it must be housed in the faculty of education. And that was a very wise decision because Mangali Sosobukwe was a teacher in school. Then he went to Vets and then he went to, to Rowe. He was about to go to Rose University. But he made a decision and realized that he would not be able to liberate the Azanian people, you know, effectively. He had to go and lead the PAC and sacrifice everything. He was a leader by excellence. I have to admire that. But at the same time, Mangali Sosobukwe said he must be armed with theory. So here we say, Education to us, in agreement then with you, means an identification with the masses, a true service to the African people. And we are here to say that Mangali Sosobukwe said in 1949, for a university to be an African university, it must draw all Africans from all over the African continent so that they can get together, share their frustrations and aspirations and be frank with one another and tell those of our brothers and sisters who come here and are given peanuts in our institution of learning and turning against fellow Azanians here. And those who are being given places in restaurants and all over the place and turning against Azanians. That we understand that they are hungry, but they must not sell us out because it, it is creating a, 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 a resentment. So we must speak to one another as Africans. These are our challenges and we are not going to solve them by destroying and killing one another. Mm -hmm. Anyone who says that is a reactionary and does not understand Pan-Africanism. And we understand that Pan-Africanism is not easy. When it is not understand, understood, then we know that those who shout, who shout loudest and saying that in spite and despite need to read Pan-Africanism more. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not going to stand because uh, I'm a kwai kwai, uh, preventing me <laughs> from doing that. But I want to try and understand the question that the, the, the gentleman, since I'm the lady, the gentleman was addressing as well, whether that is um, you know, the ICJ, China. And I'm going to stick with the Palestinian situation because it's linear. The one thing is that there are different, there, there are different reasons for this. And it's possible to do the right thing for the wrong reasons or for sketchy reasons. It could be an election year. It could be a vote grabbing tactic. It could be to distract us for the fact that we are reading inside using candles and torches. Um, and it could also be because we are trying to regain some kind of international standing. Be that as it may, I do think that the linearity between South Africa and Palestine is politically, economically, and spiritually significant. It is significant because that is one of the first sites of settler colonialism that we see that was the, product, the production of Western imperialism, including the Rothschilds. We also see it as a site of capitalism, and everywhere, that we have seen these strange settlements take place, like Afghanistan, a settlement between the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. We find a mess. And the Palestinian Middle Eastern dilemma is a similar kind of mess. What we should be asking ourselves is, what does this say about the state of Africanism and the state of imperialism? What are we also saying about Tigray region now, where half a million people have also been killed? What are we saying about DRC, where again, there's been a slow ethnic cleansing and genocide for the past six, uh, seven or eight years, where again, 600,000 people have died. And I think that, the, that what concerns me is that whilst the Palestinian issue is critical, 
I don't think that we should forget to give the same oxygen to some of these other struggles. We should also remember that the question of resettlement of land is also linked to the resettlement of economies and imperial interests. So for example, at some stage, remember that the is Israel was invited or coaxed or bribing their way into becoming uh, observers at the African Union. Thanks God, it didn't happen. But can we imagine the humiliation of being observed by a settler colonial state which is a stooge and an ally of one of the biggest neo-imperialist forces in the world, the United States? What were we thinking? We were not. We were unremembering. Or rather, they were unremembering. So remember as well that such institutions, the African Union as an institution, is a reactionary body. Which is why it almost doesn't matter whether or not we should really rely on movements or ourselves. We cannot rely on an institution like the African Union to promote radical, progressive, Africanist, anti-imperial, revolutionary um, um, ideals. Not least when that building was built by the Chinese, as you mentioned, China there. We should also remember that this comes at a time when Morocco have suddenly decided that, by the way, they are Africans again. Remember, they were trying to join the European Union not long ago. Yesterday, lunchtime, they were trying to be Europeans. Today, supper time, they're trying to join the African Union. We, those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. What is really happening here? And lastly, to say, and all of this happens at a time when the first republic, the first liberated African republic, Haiti, was declined by every African, when they applied to become members of the African Union, they were declined. I would say those are the questions, sir, that maybe we should be um, busying ourselves with. Thank you, but my Africa, until Azania, until next time, until we find our way back to our memory, let us remain focused, Ribonane, because Batri Likai Riteng, we are where we are here. Sani Bonane, you are seen, you are present, we are not banished, we are where we are here. Mobu Warona. Thank you very much for that, and thank you um, for the questions and the responses. I would now like to ask um, Mr. Mzwanele Nyocho, Nyonto, sorry, the PAC president, to do the vote of thanks. Thank you. This is it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have seen institutions of higher learning commemorating Sobukwe without PAC. We have seen everybody commemorating Sobukwe, including Forte University, where Sobukwe was the SRC president doing everything without PAC. Thank you, Nelson Mandela University. <clears throat> C 
see and get in your class, sing a manual and all manual. Sing a acknowledge or no acknowledge. I see no tea, Miss Enzel into a Gulugangak. See figure Tina Sinibus in Dresden at Tibenang and elect Chagasobu. That's not all. Didn't bully Silek. When did man lungs alone, runs a bani kumbul, but man shall say gum, or loudly PAC. Vice Chancellor, Prof. Bongile Mutua, Sekbulela for allowing us to have this event and doing the welcome in your absence. DVC Learning and Teaching, Dr. Muiwe Mueng, for being the program director. <laughs> DVC Engagement and Transformation, Prof. Andrew Kidd, as well as DVC People and Operations, Mr. Lutando Jack, for their support. The Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Education, Prof. Hiloise, and the Faculty of Education for hosting the event and for all the arrangements that were done for this event. Mr. Alan Zinn for his guidance and support in the planning of the event. Ms. Jack Smith, Ms. Kishma Daniels, Mr. Bruce Gordon and Mr. Tato Mshweshwe for their assistance with the arrangements. Media and communication for all their support, protection and protocol services as well as the South African police for assisting with the safety and security services. Ms. Nozugo Khai and the Faculty of Education Choir, Faculty of Education and the Pasma Student Marshals. Mr. Derek Hoshe for arranging the attendance of the school learners. Nebona Mosbani Palelele. Determine Kale Ngayoke. President Nelvis Kagaman Akbulis, Azapo President and the Azapo leadership, Chairman Nikboni Nopal, Secretary General of PAC, Comrade Powe, and PAC leadership, Sundis and others, then Bona. Kamana Nangak Bulisi, MMC, Kuba, you are going to do the same lecture in two weeks' time, and it will be delivered by Professor Cotton Sida. Siani Bulis, and Siani Bulel. Thank you for coming. Prof, I can't do something I ask you. I can't do something I ask you. Those of us who have been in this organization, I can't do something I ask you. God, what the fact that Kubizwa were now so tetango so bukwe, yes, all is alone to tin. Africa, peg. Ugubizwa kwa akuzo teta ngosobu kwe yasifu yisa londoti. Sikaluboni institution zibiza zenze usobu kwe. Zibiza bandu from the ruling party ba tete ngosobu kwe benga maz no maz. Aba anta banga na wako anti ba tiba nisa nosobu kwe. That's why the city we are forever grateful kwe ni University of Nelson Mandela. I'm not a speaker. But just a few remarks before I sit down, program director. What strikes me in the face as a very important phenomenon is the wider acceptance of Mangali Sosobukwe as an iconic figure of the liberation movement, particularly now that we are in the year 2024, the year of his centenary. The first cycle of admirers is obviously the PAC members and followers. The second are students of the National Liberation Struggle who apply themselves to understand Sobukwe's thoughts. Then there are legions of Pan-Africanists on a wild weight basis. In our country, a campaign to rob Sobukwe out of history has been engineered by the apartheid and settler regime. Even in the new post-apartheid dispensations, attempt to make Sobukwe insignificant have met 
with a resistance only Sobukwe and Africanists can understand. Young people born after 1994 raised their voice against the authorities in the Fees Must Fall movement, Azani. Many of them were inspired by the life and times of Mangali Sosobuk. Today, we have a wide range of PAC followers and members whose main intention is preserve and secure the image and voice of Sobukwe at the polls in 2024. Come 29 May 2024, we expect to see this growing phenomenon expressing itself with a cross on the ballot paper in favor of Sobukwe and the PAC comrade Tepo Sobukwe, the grandson of Sobukwe in our midst. We're doing this for your grandfather. We are his disciples. Sobuko, of course, comes from a humble background. He was gifted as a young student. His intellectual growth gained ground phenomenally, and his articulation of ideas for the cause of the Africanists was super. Even his elders and teachers could see that the talents and gifts in him. He was a dedicated teacher and took his work very seriously. Students received extra classes outside school hours to help them to be serious and pass their exams convincingly. He articulated the basic position of the Africanists better than some of the early founders. He impressed APM Da such that the Elder Youth League founder and Africanist theoretical expert traveled to Forte University College to meet up with the, with the phenomenal Sobukwe. Sobukwe spoke to the illiterate people in their languages. He mastered Sesotho and Isikosa. He did not use abstract ideas to communicate with ordinary people. The grassroots leaders took up arms after he was incarcerated, the Porto insurrection. Increased its intensity during his time on Robben Island maximum prison. About a hundred of them were executed in Pretoria Central Prison during period 1961 and 1968. Sobukwe even spoke to the courts in a language of the judiciary. He is the first to use the witness box in a court of law to fight for justice. The rest tried, but never so successfully as Sobukwe. The phenomenon touched the activists for justice to declare with him that it is meet that we speak the truth before we die. I have come to understand why a biography on Sobukwe is entitled, How Can Men Die Better? And thank you very much. <laughs>